Welcome to No Occasion the Shout. Today we are going to be talking about my conversation with Jordan Peterson and Robin's going to weigh in on that. And uh, I will uh, link that in the bottom for you to see the conversation with Jordan Peterson. But basically I asked him three questions and he answered the three questions very well. And let's just go through it. The first question I asked him was, how can we be sure that anyone of us is speaking the same language? If the definitions that I give to my words are the same as the definitions that Robin gives to my words, and that we're basically all on the same page, or that language is just different for everybody and there's always going to be a communication problem. Uh, Robin, do you have an answer for that? If so I this, is, you? this is one of the, the fundamental things that I teach in political communication when I start hmm. like my intro, introductory kind of, you know, seminar on, on that topic. Um, I talk about Thomas Kuhn and paradigms, right? Mm -hmm. And I talk about how, um, in general, different paradigms in commensurate or can be in commensurate, right? Now, a paradigm being the set of concepts through which you, or with which, you don't only interpret the world, but you conceive and perceive the world. And Goethe said, you see only what you know, which should sound weird when you first hear it, because most people think you get the sense data and then that, turns, that gives you knowledge, right? But Goethe said it's the other way around. We're only capable of perceiving what we already know. And of course, what we already know, we can only know in, um, depending on the type of knowledge, but a lot of what we know, we know in language. Right. So, so the concepts that are built into our um, language, so we can talk about linguistic paradigms, right, um, are, are what we have to work with and we don't even know, uh, and, and we're working with them kind of um, implicitly, right? We're not always questioning the words that we're using. We think that they give us the basic conceptual building blocks. And an example I use, um, a lot. I mean, I've got a few examples, but a, a kind of a simple one is the English word home. Because in English, you can say, um, you know, uh, maybe you've been out to see a friend and say, okay, I'm, I'm getting tired, I'm going home now, meaning going back to where you live, right? You can also say things like, an Englishman's home is his castle, where I lay my head is home. Um, and interestingly, you could be on, on a vacation, you could be staying in a hotel for a week, and at the end of the day, you could say, I'm going back home to the hotel. Right? So now this meaning of home in English has, n has no direct translation to any other language. Um, it's just a good, I mean, it, I mean, strictly speaking, no word has a direct, to your point, translation. But as near as damn it, many do. But a word home doesn't. Now, when we are, the, the actual meaning um, that is in a word, um, of course, is a function of the way it's used in relationship to other words stroke meanings. And uh, because most people who live in a, a single language speaking community are actually learning the language by exposure to its usage, right? Um, it's kind of necessarily the case that more or less the words will mean the same thing to me as they do to you if you're a speaker of well, the same Jordan, language. Jordan Peterson went a little different route with it. Okay, I haven't finished um, my point, but go on. Do you want to finish your point? I was, I was going to say, but, but because usage and relationships with other meanings will begin to diverge as individuals use them, um, we end up with different connotations and somewhat different relationships between these words and other words. And so, and this is a large part of what problem we have in, in uh, speaking across political paradigms. We're using the same words with different meanings. Or alternatively, yes. we have in different paradigms, we may not even have the same meaning. We may not be able to convey in a direct way the same meaning. So you've got like this two-sided problematic coin. The apparent same words with different meanings and the same meanings not even existing across paradigms. So, yes. um, well, Jordan so yeah, Peterson, as you were going to say about Jordan. Yeah, he, had the, he proposed a solution. He says, what you do is you establish a goal. And when that, he first said that you, you can't, you can't ever know that we're speaking the same language or we're on the same page. But what you can do is you can establish a goal 
And when that goal is completed, then that's good enough. So for example, he used the example of having a task of taking bricks from one side to another side. And regardless of the language and whether or not people are being understood to the exact degree, once the bricks are taken from the first side to the other side, that is good enough. That establishes that the language was sufficient in order to establish the goal. Well, that's, yeah, that's, I mean, sure, that's good as far as it goes, but that's good when you're trying to use a language, uh, use language uh, with, in pursuit of a direct, finite goal that might have an end. Um, but a lot of what we do with language isn't that. So then I would say, um, to kind of extend, I, I guess, where Peterson was going with that, I, I would say, we can, with continued communication, get as arbitrarily close to um, yes. some level of confidence that we do mean the same thing by confirming, yeah, we've got this meaning, and then confirming the relationships between surrounding meanings and that meaning, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, we would indeed That's stop how memes that. Kind we... of work. Say again? That's kind of how memes work. How do you mean? Um, there's um, a theme to the meme, and the more you see it, the more you generally understand the concept, and it becomes uh, a language. Whereas if you see, sometimes you see a meme for the first time, you don't understand it. Until you see four or five of them, and then you, you notice the pattern in all four or five of them. Uh, you haven't happened to have read my book, right? I haven't. Well, I've got a great example of this. It's kind of my favorite example of all time of just what you said, which was interesting. Um, do you remember when there were the terrorist attacks in, in, uh, in England, in London? Uh, the 7-7 seven, yes, seven the, the painter? Or the comic? Oh, no, you're thinking of France. No, no, when they oh, uh, simultaneously France. blew up some subways and some buses. It, oh, it yeah, was, in England. Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. It was a while ago now. And um, I found, I saw online, somebody had made this, well, today we'd call it a meme. And it was just a picture of a cup of tea. And it said, some, I, I, we drink tea in your general direction. We drink tea in your general direction. And I, I put this in the book as an example of this, uh, of, of, of linguistic paradigms, right? Mm -hmm. Because I have not been able to give that to an American and have an American understand what it's actually saying. But if you give it to a Brit, they light up and get it immediately. And it's really kind of subtle. It shows you, so here we are using the exact same words in English and let's say American. Like you understand mm -hmm. what all of those words mean as an American. But because in England, it's situated in a British cultural paradigm, right? Mm -hmm. um, you've got, we drink tea in your general direction. The drinking of the tea, signifies we're going to carry on doing the thing that makes us us regardless of anything you might do mm -hmm. right speaking to terrorists and the in your general direction the, the the word general it's kind of a play on the english understatement and the fact that we're not even going to take you seriously enough to look at exactly where you are right we're mm -hmm. going to not be that distracted we're only going to be distracted enough to imagine somebody drinking tea, to, to, to move into the general direction of the, of the terrorist acts, right? And drink our tea only in the general direction. And it's very subtle, actually, when you kind of deconstruct it. And, um, but it's so, it captures so much about the British self-identity. And in the night, in just a few words, really spoke to the difference between how the British handled 7-7 and how the Americans handled 9-11. It was all right there in this one picture of this cup of tea in just these few words. And I, I put it in, in my book as an example of just how powerful the context um, that, for language, which is often a cultural context, I mean, necessarily it's a partially um, mm -hmm. how powerfully that can actually inform or determine the meaning of the words that we use. Yes, and for sure. You said meme and 
That was one. I yeah. just thought it was a beautiful one. All right. So the second question was on gender. I asked Jordan Peterson, I said, is it a, that absurd of a concept that someone might be born with an XY uh, brain and an XX body or vice versa because it happens in nature and transgenderism occurs in nature? And basically, I was asking him why he thinks there are only two genders. And you listen to this. Mm. Um, and he said that, no, that's not the argument that he is making. The argument he was making was that regardless of the um, amount of sexes or amount of genders, they are heavily biologically influenced. But he's not saying that there are only two genders and that there are women that are born with, uh, that have male chromosomes and people that are born with genitalia that are unidentifiable and people with born with chromosomes that don't match up to an, uh, uh, bimodal XXXY uh, dichotomy, so to speak. And the the argument that he was making is simply that it is biologically uh, predisposed or influenced. There's and, a very high R squared on the correlation between, yes. uh, between biological sex and self-identified gender. Massively, yes. massively, massively. Right. Yes. And he said it's ironic because it's not even helpful to admit that it's not biologically influenced, especially for some of the transgenders who are actually transgender, who actually have a brain that is uh, similar to a male brain, but their, their body is female. And it's not helpful to say that it's not biologically influenced. So it's hurtful towards the transgender types. Uh, and you, you heard that conversation. Uh, I'll link that also. It is just a yeah, portion of the no, absolutely, and I, and I think um, I think Jordan's Jordan's been very clear on this. I mean, I know you and I have both listened to a lot of Jordan Peterson, and uh, I, I've certainly never heard him say, "Oh, there's only two genders in in, in that form." Um, yes, but yeah, his he, supporters say that. Say again, May, well, of his yeah, you know, and everybody's that. tarred with the brush of their supporters, right? It's the bane of. And, yeah. you know, and I, and I, I always like to point out that Keynes was not a Keynesian and Darwin was not a Darwinist. Um, you know, if you actually yeah. read them, right? Um, and so on and so on, right? So, People get N Nietzsche really uh, messed up too. I, I, I mean, sure, absolutely. In fact, I think there's not an important th th thinker that doesn't get seriously bastardized, right? I think mm -hmm. they wouldn't be horrified um, by what's been done with their thought. Um, so uh, maybe that's when I know I've made it, you know, is when you know, these kernels are counting and stuff I don't know. Uh, yeah. That's, that's what we're going for, um, this public and direct. Um, so uh, what was that what I was going to say? Yeah, and, and I mean, also, uh, I mean, I think this is fascinating. I, I, you know, the endocrinological system, um, yeah, you can't, it would be interesting to, you know, if you look at brain structure, um, form of genitalia, endocrinology, <laughs> um, chromosomes, uh, all of those correlations would be fascinating to specify out and separate out. You could almost get a series of linked R squares, I guess, mm -hmm. right? Um, it's a, a fascinating, fascinating field. Fascinating field. Yeah. All right. All right. And that's, you know, we both agree on that. There's not much uh, debate there. Um, and lastly, Oh, I asked him, I asked him two more questions. I asked him four questions. My other question was, and we've talked about this for before, just that is it possible or do you think it's likely that people's political beliefs, whether it be pro-abortion, anti-abortion, pro-gay marriage, anti-gay marriage, pro-guns, anti-guns, those types of things are ultimately influenced by their, uh, upbringing in regards to self-preservation. So for example, if you look at big cities, um, the, they tend to be more liberal. And if you really look at the situation of a big city, you might think actually, yeah, it's probably good that they are more liberal because they're a lot of people grouped closely together. Um, and the policies for liberals being less concerned about life, uh, less concerned about marriage, 
um, less concerned about family, more concerned about getting along, being together, being accepting. But if you look at the politics of people who are generally in rural areas, it's more appropriate for them because they are with their family in a small area. They don't know anybody else. They have to be more cautious. They have to be not as, um, if, if they die out, then that's their, that's, that's their lineage. There's not a, a whole bunch of people. So they need to be very cautious and make sure that they survive. It's more about survival. It's more about keeping you and your family alive. Um, so my question was basically, um, is it possible that people's political beliefs, even though people say that this one is moral and this one isn't moral, they're both moral based on self-preservation and that the self-preservation is the objective morality. And he said, um, it's a good hypothesis. I, you would have to do some more tests. Uh, yeah. Yeah, no, and I, I mean, clearly environment, you know, environment affects the experienced outcomes of your, of policy, right? And so indirectly your political belief. And if, um, so if, for example, uh, you know, I, I live in Seattle and if I walk, like, for me to get on a bus to go anywhere in Seattle, I'm going to go down Third Avenue, which is notorious for um, a lot of the, the addicts and, and uh, you know, and the people who are suffering from addiction, maybe living in shelters, homelessness, whatever. Um, it can be quite um, intimidating, um, you know, if you're not, uh, let's say, confident and able to defend yourself when you literally you're walking within inches of people shooting up right on the street. And so... I'm actually having data as an urban dweller um, that is telling me about what policies, you know, the policies that affect other people are feeding back to me in a different way from if I lived on a ranch in the middle of, you know, nowhere. Um, so obviously that's going to affect what I believe, or what I experience about mm -hmm. individuality, about the living, as you say, within a family unit versus living within a community. Um, yeah. Because it may be if I'm in a rural area, my family unit is going to determine a lot more of my experience than the wider community. But if I live in a place like downtown Seattle, the opposite is almost certain to be true. And mm -hmm. if you think about that, um, yeah, a lot of people who will live in, down, in, in a big city downtown uh, will hardly ever be directly affected by their family because the family doesn't live in the, you know, in the, even in the same city. Mm -hmm. um, whereas in small town America, or, you know, let's say, you know, a lot of families will live within a few mile radius and they're never going to see serious consequences um, mm -hmm. of policy among those who they have no familial uh, kin yeah. or, or kin kinship or kithship connection. So it makes complete sense. I mean, yeah. I, I think, I think it, it, it has to be the case. It's a logical necessity. Yeah. I think the word you're getting like, at is, I feel like is, it's is a cause of intuition. Effect. Yeah, and I want to do mean, some I, tests. Like, I think it's I prima test. facie, that it, it's a prima facie. Yeah, uh, I mean, you know. we, we can prove this pretty easily. Ask people, are you close with your family, yes or no? What's your political belief, right or left? And you should probably see that, I would say, I would say a pro to, to be able to prove uh, what we're saying is true, maybe a 65 or 70% um, success rate in people who are closer with their family being more conservative. Mm. Um, yeah. But I would expect it to be even higher, maybe 90%. 90% um, of people who are close with their family say they're conservative. 90% of people who say they're not close to their family say they're liberal. But really you don't even need that much to prove that there's a correlation. All you need is about 60, 65%, depending on how large the sample size is. Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. Um, yeah, and the other thing, of course, is that mechanisms that optimize good across a family simply are not operable um, in an urban environment among, you know, a yes. larger community and vice mm -hmm. versa, right? Yes. Um, you know, so in a family, you, you don't typically, you don't have an appeal to, as it were, a neutral authority that doesn't mm -hmm. have an emotional investment with all of its, all of the subjects or objects of the policy. Yes. Whereas in a city that you do, you go to an, like a city council, 
-hmm. and then you know you 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 you, as it were you appeal up and then you legislate down it's a completely Mm -hmm. different yeah you're you're actually doing a different thing when you're doing family politics let's say from urban politics or community Mm -hmm. politics so it's so it's yeah it's many layers and yeah i think we you know speaking of the paradigm um you know we we don't realize the extent to which we're actually doing different things when we say and think we're doing the same thing. It's like, oh, politics is politics. Well, no, it isn't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it really isn't. Um, but yeah, once you're, do, like we've got this word politics, but it means something in completely different things in different domains. And mm-hmm. I think we could be, we, we potentially have a lot less division and a lot less talking past each other politically uh, if we understood that, if we understood that. Yes. And that goes into the whole open borders, closed borders thing, because uh, it might be different for Texas <laughs> than it is for uh, another state. Maybe Texas is the one state that should have a little bit some border control. Um, well, you see that. See, that's interesting. And, I, and at some point before, maybe before next year's out, I'm going to write a big article about this. Because yeah. even, even as you say that, your uh, lots of libertarians would be upset, you see. Because if well, I said open, maybe, I don't know. No, no, but I, even but the fact that you allow <laughs> it means that you're allowing that contingencies on the ground, right, could inform the principle, if it is a principle, of opening the borders. Now, to libertarian purists, right, there's nothing on the ground that could affect the goodness of opening borders. So for them, it's more akin to, um, you know, don't worry about who will pick the cotton. The right thing to do is free the slaves. Well, right? so don't. Yeah. Yeah. It depends on the circumstance. Um, but again, to many, it doesn't. Because mm. just as a lot of people would not accept you could say that about freeing the slaves, they, they would say it's more akin to that, right? This drops straight out of the axioms of the philosophy that you open the borders. You're, in saying that, you're allowing that may not be the case. And, uh, if, and I think that's a very interesting division within the liberty. But those, those, those libertarians are also tend to be a little bit more socialist. So they would be in favor of Canada. And Canada a, has a border. Hold on. Whoa, whoa, whoa. How do you get that? Well, open border libertarians are more open, socialist than what's Open sense? border t- libertarians tend to be more left leaning. Oh, okay. Okay. So they would be, they would be more they would look at Canada more favorably than a right leaning libertarian and Canada has borders. I think that a lot of people, although I understand what you mean by that, I think a lot of the strident uh, open border libertarians would say in as much as um, I'm absolutely for open borders, I'm more of an anarchist. And therefore, I reject you calling me uh, left-leaning because mm. that speaks to an impurity of my philosophy. I'm sure I've heard that. Yeah, in different words. yeah, they might. But say I that. understand okay. what you're getting at. I think it's All right. but yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, you can have uh, open access with documentation. You, you, you can. But of course, you know, a lot of the libertarians will say, you know, that's just, that's a form of still a government imposition. We don't need do- documentation. Mm. So what do we do about everyone who already has documentation right now? Because that's not fair. So does that mean I, everyone in the world has the right to get rid of their social security number? Oh, that's, like, a, well, that's think about these policies actually going into place. We would, there would, it would be pure chaos. So, if, so this is so the, uh, the big thesis I'm working on now speaks to that speaks to you see in an impure world purism is actually not principle yeah and this was a big realization for me and and for the exact what and what you've just said spoke to uh, spoken to there is one of the three uh, big themes i want to tackle in this thesis and what you're speaking to there is basically transient effects in an imperfect complex system um and a lot and it's part of what i'm going to call in this article methodological purism, that you completely ignore transience. Um, but I think you're right not to. And this is a fundamental problem I have with, with any kind of philosophical purism imposed, mm-hmm. even if it's one that I broadly agree with, um, or morally and sympathetic. To well, like you know, the to non-aggression impose. principle, for example. I can let my two-year-old daughter starve under the non-aggression principle because I'm not doing anything wrong. 
I think I think you're going to love. I'm not that. aggressing. <laughs> I actually so, take a couple of examples of those big moral rules exactly yeah. like that, and I think I don't know if I use the non-aggression. Maybe I. Um, I think I maybe there's I there's exceptions I, to everything. There's circumstances for everything. Well, what happens with a lot of these rules is you move the argument to the meaning of the word, or mm. right. So you get into like a pathological commitment to the. The, the principle and then you have these ridiculous arguments about the meaning of the words or you end up saying yeah okay well within any sensible reading there's a there's a limitation of scope of application and which itself isn't purist either right and i i, I um i mean i'm i'm coming from where you're coming from yeah for sure all right and the last question was me, I, I asked him this under the assumption that uh, religion was created for the purpose of uh, maintaining a social structure and helping people through their innate predispositions to their psyche and making it easier for them to cope with their own existence. And that it was, uh, that was the assumption I was making asking him this. And I said, in that sense, insofar as humans do not, humans do not feel particularly rewarded when they achieve a goal, they are just content and driven in pursuit of the goal. So the neuro... Um, sociologically or neuro, um, psych neuropsychologically, what drives man or human is the pursuit of a goal. And once they achieve that goal, they're actually at a point where they're like, oh, you know what I mean? They, they, the pursuit was what was, what was keeping yeah. their happiness, serotonin, dopamine. Serotonin, yeah. Well, it's like so, the pursuit is of a goal is really, of a meaningful goal is your serotonin. Right? Yes. And then you get it and you get your dopamine hit and it's gone in two days. And it's gone. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. absolutely, um, yeah. So I said, in that sense, isn't the idea of heaven kind of manipulative um, insofar as a psychologist writing the book would might be able to come up with uh might would come up with a different psychological representation of the human psyche in the in the bible other than the idea of eternal life because that idea just seems kind of manipulative uh because it's not it's it's a it's a representation of the human psyche which is Jordan Peterson's argument for the, the entirety of the Bible. Um, but I think it's one of the more dishonest ones because it's, it's promising. The rest of the Bible pretty much is pretty fair if you look at it from a psychological point of view. Heaven, I said, seems manipulative. Okay, I don't understand, I don't understand that distinction. So, so what do you mean? I don't understand what you mean by saying heaven is manipulative and nothing else is in the same way. What, what, what is it that, that he, the concept of heaven has that nothing else in the Bible has to make it so? It, the realism. It's not... But it's, sh surely you wouldn't claim that every other concept that, affect, that, is, that affects human behavior if believed in the Bible is realistic or true, would you? Um... Kind of. I see a lot wow. of it. I see a lot of it as a metaphorical representation of, of. But why can't you see heaven as that? I don't understand. I don't understand the qualitative distinction between the idea of heaven and everything else. It's interesting. I guess you could, but the rest of it is written in stories in threes in I guess heaven heaven was the only concept that people actually really um believed in and stuck to like it was something that I feel like a psychologist writing the bible would know people are going to actually take this too seriously and too far and it's going to become um 
I just feel like the uh, the idea of eternal life um, if if the Bible is a metaphorical representation of the human psyche, then the idea of eternal life is something that one might have known was going to be taken too far or be abused or be as too opposed, much for as people. Opposed to what? I mean, I, I just like, how about, you know, the historicity of the resurrection? Isn't that like, I mean, in terms of being taken too far and being abused, I mean, people have, more people have died as a result of, let's say, being forced to believe in that than being forced in, to believe in heaven specifically, largely because people from various traditions believe in heaven in some form, but only people in one broad tradition believe in the uh, historical fact of the resurrection. And so we've had crusades, we've had the inquisitions, we've had, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So wouldn't that be more problematic? Not if you're looking at the Bible strictly from a psychological standpoint. Okay, so then I don't know what you mean by that. You're looking at it as a psychology book, as a metaphorical representation of uh, the brain or the psyche. You're going to have to unpack this. I still want to understand what, what, what it is that makes heaven the most dangerous concept in there or the most... I don't know, you're saying dangerous? You're saying... Yeah, you're saying so, powerful. You're saying powerful. Okay, so suicide bombers. Can yeah. you think of, do they do that because of uh, they believe in religion or do they do that for eternal life? I think they, well, you see, that's interesting. No, I know. I think you have to, um, I mean, maybe the 72 maidens supposedly help, you know, but um, that the, you know, the Muslims, yes. jihad is supposed to get. But, but that's but, eternal um, life, isn't it? I, I think, it, yeah, the payoff. Yeah, I mean, I think the payoff, um, although whether the payoff has to be in that exact form, I, I see. But you see, no, I, I don't think, because I don't think it works on its own, because you don't get the payoff of eternal life unless you also believe in another set of axioms, right? So, so I, that makes the other axioms at least as important as the heaven idea. Like surrender to Allah. Right, it has to be something that is at least as important as eternal life. If you're going to get, if, if eternal okay. life can motivate you to do that, similarly, right. so, on the, yeah, you can make the same a similar, yeah, parallel case for Christians, so, so on and so on. Jordan Peterson answered this as uh, he said, "Well, you can look at it that way. You definitely can. That's an interpretation. Nietzsche definitely did." And then he said, "But my question to you is, um, why isn't hell manipulative, manipulative then?" Why doesn't anyone talk about hell? When, I, when Nietzsche brought, brought up this, the point that I was making, uh, apparently Nietzsche made the same point. Um, he never mentioned hell. Why, yeah, why isn't think... hell manipulative? And for some reason, I just don't see, I guess he has a point there. But You think he has a point? He, I, I think he has, uh, there's some subconscious bias that is affecting my thinking clearly because I thought of heaven as manipulative, not as hell. I didn't go directly to hell. So I wonder if this, this is a really interesting question. Um, I wonder if it goes to the different personalities of the people hearing each. When I was, I and mean, this is a long story, and I could tell, I could do a whole show telling the story, but one of the most, um, uh, the, the biggest deals of my life was as, uh, was in my late teens. And I, so I should say I was religious to the age of 14 or 15. I lost my faith at that age. And I was a happy kind of intellectually seeking agnostic for a while until I got to 18 or 19 years old. And I went to a lecture by a doctor of physical chemistry who was also a Baptist minister. This was when I was at Cambridge studying mm -hmm. physics. And in this lecture, he, I went up to this guy after the lecture 
um, and he was about you know the science religion thing and um, and I, I liked him because there he was as a Baptist minister, but also he knew a lot of quantum mechanics and it was quantum mechanics that was the thing that actually it's another thing that caused me to lose my faith um, in part, in large part. And, um, and so I, uh, he said to me when I spoke to him after the lecture, God will not come to you, Robin, to satisfy your intellectual curiosity. And that threw me for the best part of two years because it caused me to question my motivation for not believing in Christianity, which I had believed in before. And in particular, at the time, I had, I, I had a relationship with, with what, who, a woman who was my first girlfriend, a girl who was my first girlfriend. And we were having a normal, intimate relationship. And I thought that maybe the reason I didn't want to let God into my life, to use this Baptist minister's uh, kind of phrase um was was that i didn't want to give up the goodies i had right by being in a sexual relationship etc etc mm. and um and so that uh, there was part of my mind that was motivating me not to believe in a truth now, this is why i'm telling you the story i went into a religious terror for months and i became ill over the fact that if that were true and i got run over by a bus tomorrow I could be sent straight to hell and I'd have no excuse. So I started going into a massive motivational deconstruction that ended up sending me initially to a counselor and then having a breakdown and then being sent to a doctor. And it was literally because of the fear of hell. Hmm. And I believe, and, and, and that was something that I had absorbed as a minor, right? I was 18 or 19 years old, re reprocessing this. But the idea, I had, I had accepted that, you know, the basic, let's call it the kind of the orthodox, mm. small O, not like big O, um, Christian story as a kid. And it came back and haunted me terribly. And, um, and I therefore would be quite sanguine, I think, about hauling up on uh, charges of abuse, all of all of the officials of the church that perpetuate the idea of hell among children. Because if you take it seriously, and I did, because I was slightly precocious intellectually and, and in other ways, right? Um, and, I, and morally, and I you know, wanted to be this good boy. And here was a system that enabled me to assess myself or good or, mm -hmm. as good or bad, which I think now was a big part of the pull of, of, of that rather crude understanding of Christianity that I, I had adopted as a, as a younger teenager and as a child. Um, you know, given all of those things, uh, this institution and the people who promulgated the power of this institution um, did me absolute indisputable harm. And, and for me, it was the hell idea that motivated me. So maybe the powers that be that have developed this, maybe with sinister intent or maybe not, over centuries, have these two pillars, because some work better with the carrot and some work better with the stick, and it was the stick that worked better on me. So maybe it's just that, maybe the, the people that respond to the stick, like I did when I was younger, maybe we're fewer in number, but maybe that works for some. And so they well, keep working. Most, you know, most, like, people, most people do not, believe that they can go to hell no one will they believe don't know. unless true. unless they have a breakdown like you do less that no, no i i be, just to be clear i believed the poss i believed that it was possible before i was having a breakdown over the fear because of the fear that it caused me like mm. it was a belief that i had i had had so i already and i i now look back at it and i don't believe it but but I did because I was a child and it, and it had worked on me. And, I, you know, you could say in some ways in an unsophisticated mind. So yes. it's, it's not... Most you know, people think of it like I karma. That's why it's a, a desirable concept for them. Because people need karma in order to cope with the horrible things that are happening in life. So the concept of people going to hell is very... Um, helpful for them to process the abuse that they experience from other people because everyone experiences abuse the idea that somebody gets their just desserts yes and this is this is um also speaks to something interesting that i i, I take some time in a separate part of my political psychology uh seminars to talk about which is 
when you look at effective political insurgencies across the political spectrum, the one thing um, that you can get, pretty much everybody, I mean, 80 something percent of people um, are motivated by is, is a raw injustice. Mm-hmm. And it turns out, in, and this has been repeated in, uh, repeatedly found in, in, in an increasingly wide range of eco- behavioral economics experiments, that people will actually pay to punish somebody oh, that yeah, I does a, test. Yeah, uh, uh, um, an unprovoked injustice against um, uh, another human being, even if they don't know either of the human beings involved. See, if you can harness that, and I think you, what you said there about health speaks yeah. to this deep human need, desire, moral desire. Yeah, I think I'm more, I'm more motivated by wanting to be a good person. If I went to heaven um, at the end of my life, I would want to give it up to a random person in hell. I would want to trade my spot because I'm... I'm at no payoff to you. The payoff to me is that the other person knows that I, I sacrificed myself for them. But you and wouldn't see, then you have a, you've changed the definition of hell because in hell you wouldn't be able to enjoy that knowing <laughs> by the, uh, by, I think the most, uh, you know, the crude, uh, old fashioned medieval definition of hell which I think I was working with as a child. And I yes, still but if I go to on. heaven first, I can still have that. I can't, I can't imagine being in heaven and not having a moral compass and not saying mm, that's interesting. there are people in hell that are suffering for eternity. And um, I don't know, maybe they had a bad childhood. You don't you know, know. This is, you know, <laughs> I think you've, what you might have gotten there is a quite nifty little argument against the logical consistency of the notion of heaven and hell. Yeah, I mean, people, here's the thing, people have in their their brains, it's like, I, I don't seem to have this, but people have a very strong notion of if someone does something wrong, they need to be punished for it. Um, and right, right. I agree to that to an extent. I do agree to that to an extent. If someone has a bad action, they should be punished for it. I just don't see how eternal punishment forever is ever fair. Ever proportional, ever justifiable. Yeah. And yeah. I would, I don't know. I, it might speak, I don't know what that says about me, that I, I would want, I would want somebody else to know that I would want someone else to know the feeling that I love them so much that I was willing to sacrifice myself. You know, that's kind of interesting want, because I would want someone to know that so they felt special. But I don't know if that's if is that selfish. Like I don't know. I don't know what that drive is. I I can honestly say it's true. I would. You know. You know. I wouldn't be able to live with myself. I wouldn't be able to live with myself if I if I was in heaven. I would have to give it up. I wouldn't feel morally right. If um, the, 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 the traditional Christian story is that Jesus descended to hell for three days um, to, save, uh, to save everybody. You're prepared to go to hell for eternity. So that makes you better than Jesus. <laughs> yes, save one it's, person. it's something I would, I would, I would, I must, it's something I must, I'm going to must if, hmm. I will regret it if it happens. I must. If it is so terrible. Um, see, if... I mean, if, the whole thing is, this is, a, this is a whole hypothetical. I mean, this is yes, an intellectual if it, game. If it is hypothetically true, then apparently while I'm in heaven, I'll have the knowledge that um, in heaven, truth is different than it is on earth. And it makes sense in heaven that people should be punished and uh once i see how i'll be like oh never mind i don't want to give up my spot because it will be so terrible that i won't be able to do it but right now like i don't know how you can't die 
like what's the worst, the worst pain you can possibly be in is something that kills you, but you can't die. Oh no, you, hold on, just the fact that pain kills you, that's not the measure of pain. That's not the consequence, it's the actual experience of pain. Yes, but the, <coughs> you, you have to survive. So how bad can it possibly be if you can't die? You have to survive. Oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think this is how many angels can da dance on the head of a pin, but I think, it can be, I think it can be worse than you can imagine in principle. I mean, I've been through, I've been tortured and I've been through um, extreme amounts of pain and the pain hurts very, very badly at first, but your body shuts off basically. Your body, I can tell you, your brain will shut off and just be like, um, mm. that's probably, it's probably not true for breaking bones because that must suck because it, like if you break your femur bone, like, or something like that, it's one hit. But if you're being like, um, hit over and over again yeah. or cut over yes. and over again, your brain sure. eventually says like, okay, he's not getting the point of the pain. Like it's not working. And then the brain shuts off. Yep. Yep. Um, when in kickboxing, when I did kickboxing, really, really, really hard shots that rung my bell, I didn't even feel because I was like out for a second, really hard shots. I didn't feel them as much. The, the ones that hurt, or the, the ones that didn't knock you out, that didn't ring your bell, that just, um, that just hit you softer. So in a way, the, if a shot was really hard, it didn't hurt you as bad okay. as, if, as if, if it was just uh, uh, a softer shot. Um, because when, when you get hit really, really, really hard, um, sometimes you go out for a second, there's a, there's a flash, your brain, um, adrenaline rush right yeah. away. You don't, you don't really feel it. It's just a shock. Whereas if you get hit, like not that hard, like no, just I'm right sure. in the face, like you feel it cause you're still conscious and you're there. So the concept of eternal or like the most immense suffering you can think of doesn't make sense in, um, in earth terms. Okay. Well, that's <laughs> the horrible note to end on <laughs> or a good note to end on, but we're, we're about there. That was an interesting episode. It was a very <laughs> controversial episode. Was it? Why'd you say that? I don't know because, um, religion. Because religion. <laughs> Look, we sex, religion, politics, the three thing your mother three things your mother there says never to talk about. That's that's what we talk about on the show. So, you know, everyone should be controversial. Um but to all those people who are upset at uh my interpretation of religion, I will say that I agree morally with the concepts that are taught in religion, even in regards to um, a lot of the, of the sexual restraints. I don't, I think it's, I don't, I don't think anything has to be done. I think you can do whatever you want and live a perfectly happy life. But I do think those truths in the Bible, if you, the more you restrain your, your physical urges, the more you constrain your ana, ana, animalistic urges and biology, uh, the more control you will feel and the happier you will be. I will say that. I don't think that's uh, I, I think that had, there's an optimization point that there's a, there's an op that, that it's one of those functions and there's some degree of constraint restraint, which is optimal, complete restraint can that's, be pathological. And also, you know, some would point out, of course, that the, it's which bit of the Bible are you choosing? Because, you know, a lot of those, um, if you happen to marry a woman and she's not a virgin, you're supposed to take her out and, and stone her, right? So again, it's very much pick and choose. You can't just say what religion teaches. I'm sure you yes. don't. Yes. Okay. I mean, I'm sure. The, the general, the general concepts of religion, um, 
And again, I think a lot of those things are psychological representations of the human psyche. That if you go all the way back to the uh, Sumeri uh, Sumerians, Mesopotamian mm -hmm. um, texts that they were based on um, hold hold true and make more sense because the two differing stories, if you find the common themes between the two different th stories, those common themes are the ones that, that are true. Um, even the one with the Garden of Eden, which like makes sense to me as if like, if you're smart, you're not going to be happy. <laughs> if you know too much, you know what I mean? Ignorance um, is bliss. Yes. I, think I mean, ignorance is, bliss is a is direct knowledge. statement of the of the Eden story. Like literally, yes. bliss, the state of bliss before and then the fall. You yes. know, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, but like, comment, share, subscribe. Um, anything else you want to say, Robin? Anything else you want to plug? Have you been doing anything lately? I've been doing anything. I've, I've been doing things lately. Um, uh, you know what the the whole paradigm stuff and the language stuff um the first chapter which is a big chapter of my book if you can keep it which people can get it if you can keep it dot us um then get it on amazon but if they get it to if you can keep it dot us they get a sign or book. it's a um, patreon reward if you they, ah, you, you guys yes. donate if you guys Surely. donate uh i think it's like 50 or 100 dollars a month and you only have to do it one time i said that robin will sign a, a book you would send it to you Absolutely. Um, I didn't ask him, but I just assumed he'd be okay with it. I'll do that. I'll do that. So we need support for this. We need support for this. Um, so yeah. Uh, so this sounds like it sounds like um, because what we talked about this is a good show to because that paradigm stuff and the meanings of words, a lot of linguistic stuff in the in the first chapter, and it's my opening into a, a, a discussion that's more directed at politics and speaking to people with with different political concepts, let alone yes. different uh, political interpretations of the world. All right. Well, thanks, guys. I actually got to go, Robin. So I'm going to leave right now. Uh, all and right, this is the end of the episode. Thank you. Thanks, Take Robin. Care.